It is fun for me to be here because almost everyone that I have met so far is, is delightful. It's a joy for me uh, to meet people who care about the things we all care about. And let's be honest, to come here uh, to a conference like this, it says a lot about you, that you care about these things. And it, it means a lot to me, and I want to say that as somebody who is out there doing what I'm doing, to know that there are people behind the scenes supporting you or cheering you on or at least not canceling you, uh, it, it does mean a lot. It's, it's a deep encouragement to me. I want to I say that because there are times I don't think you realize, uh, I don't think you realize what it means to those of us who, who are out there. It, it means everything, really, and uh, I, I, I just wanted to say that. I want to talk to you uh, tonight uh, about a little bit about my life um, and then about how faith and freedom are inextricably intertwined, which I didn't know growing up, and I, and I suspect that most people you hear about faith and freedom kind of going together, but you don't know why or whether there is a why, and I want to... Um, I want to talk about that, but um, I was making a lot of notes today uh, in in the back of the room, uh, except obviously when Sam was speaking, because I know that stuff, but it's, uh, and I'm sure you do too, but you were very polite and nodded in all the right places, and I just want to say on behalf of my sister, thank you. Thank you for that. But um, but I was, I've was i been making a lot of notes because there are all kinds of interesting features to what we're talking about. It's not one thing. It's For me, it's about the culture. It's about the whole culture. Politics, you've heard it said, is downstream of culture. And we really abdicated the culture. Um, around 1980, I guess evangelicals in particular figured out, oh, it's going to be involved in politics, let's get involved in politics. Well, that's great. But there's a whole lot more to the culture than politics. And you can elect a born-again president, whether it's Jimmy Carter or, or uh, George W. Bush, and it can have less than no effect. Because if the whole culture is drifting in a certain direction, then you really can't do anything about it. I mean, if everybody's driving 65, everybody's driving 65. It doesn't matter if the thing says 55 or whatever. People do what they do. And if the culture is drifting in a direction, it simply doesn't matter that uh, the chief executive officer believes in Jesus as his personal savior. So those things are important, but it's obviously even more important to elect people that live out their values but maybe don't believe Jesus is their personal savior, and I'm not mentioning Trump by name. But I think even beyond that, it is really about the culture. We have effectively abdicated the culture. Um, although uh, being um, here uh, with a number of folks who've made films, uh, and Cleon, I now know that's his name, are you related to Cleon Jones, the, 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 the man who played for the New York Mets? Are all Cleons related? I love that. It's a Greek name, right? But, but uh, has made a film called Runaway Slave. And of course, Sam Sorbo and Kevin Sorbo have made a bunch of films. But I really do think it's vital that if we want to be in this fight for God's purposes, we have to be in the culture. And it doesn't mean that we need to, I, I guess the larger point I want to make is that Christians often, margin, we marginalize ourselves and we're all about theology or we're all about sometimes politics, like we get those two things. And maybe if we're in business, we get ROI, we get money. If I can make money, then I can give it to the things I believe in, whether it's politics or good churches or something like that. But there's this other thing, this other metric, and it is the culture. And I don't need to tell you, because we've been talking about it, that the culture has been going downhill steadily for many decades, but very recently it's gone plum loco. That's what we say uh, in New York when we mean crazy, plum loco. Do you have those phrases down here? Um, don't let me interrupt your food. I'm just asking, you know, <laughs> parenthetically. But we know that. That's what the culture has done. And it's done it on the watch of some Republican presidents, some genuinely conservative 
presidents. It's done. We we are in a battle, and we've really not taken the culture part seriously. So that Hollywood and Manhattan, which are the places where culture is made, my wife and I live in Manhattan. Um, they are largely secular humanist liberal, and when I say largely, I mean overwhelmingly secular humanist liberal, and that's where all the culture comes from. Um, I often have said it's it's kind of like if you let's say um, all of the water in the country were coming from New York and Hollywood and we had pipes and everybody's getting their water from those two places and you're getting sick and sicker and sicker and sicker because those places are polluted they're they're poisoned there's a you know a dead raccoon in one well and a dead armadillo in the other well right I just want to bring it down to the local level so you can track with me. And so, thank you. You've been a great audience. Thank you. And, and so I thought to myself, what about local water? What if you're getting your water locally? Wouldn't that be smarter than getting all your water piped in from these places that are poisoning you? And that is what we've done with the media. There was a time in America when you got your values locally, what the, the city fathers believed and, and what uh, the Lions Club and the this and the that. That was your culture. Well, that's changed over the years for good and for ill, mostly for ill. And mostly we are having our media piped in from places that are dramatically antithetical in their views to our views. That's just the way it is. And in a way, we're even past that now, because now, no matter where your, your stuff is coming from, the whole culture has taken on the views of the worst of Manhattan and the worst of Hollywood. And I don't say California, and I don't say New York. It is Manhattan, okay? If you, if you go around the boroughs, uh, I was born in Queens, those places are pretty religious, but Manhattan is utterly secular, right? And it was taken over by the WASP, secular, Protestant mainline, okay? When Bonhoeffer came to New York in 1930, already in 1930, ladies and gentlemen, that's 91 years ago. In 1930, Union Theological Seminary in Manhattan was utterly loony, secular, left, woke in 1930. Okay, if you read my Bonhoeffer book, I, 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 I go into it. And if you don't get a chance to read the book, just buy a copy because it wouldn't kill you. But, but in all seriousness, that was 1930. And if you were in mainline Protestant churches in 1930, as Bonhoeffer was visiting, you found that in mainline Protestant churches in New York, the gospel was not being preached. It was already over in the mainline denominations in 1930. So you kind of wonder how this has trickled down over the decades, okay? But that, that's, that's the mainline Protestantism, which has been dead for some time. We know that. But anyway, it, it goes on and on and on, the, the, the fact that this is where we find ourselves. And I, I want to say that... Um, I want to talk about my life story briefly because it ties into this, but I've, in my career, uh, you know, I'm a little bit tough to pin down because I'm not a pastor, uh, I'm not a, po a political pundit. If you listen to my program, The Eric Metaxas Show, or if you uh, watch it on, it used to be on YouTube before we were canceled, but now it's on Rumble or whatever it is, or it's on TV, and if you watch the show, we always call it the show about everything, because I really believe we Christians need to be everywhere and in everything. We can't just be theological or religious, and we shouldn't just say, well, but in my spare time I do politics and Fox News, you know. There's a world beyond politics and current events, and it's called the culture. And so I've always tried uh, to do different things, even writing the biographies that I do. I mean, they are meant as much for secular readers as for Christians, because I, I want to write things in such a way that you can share that book with somebody who's not on the same page as you are, and they'll say, well, it's just a biography. Well, it's a biography about a figure who had some faith, and so it's kind of appropriate, but I'm, it's not like I'm preaching in there. I mean, maybe I am, but I'm doing it so surreptitiously and with such brilliant nuance that they, would, they wouldn't pick up on it. Uh, actually, it's kind of funny. Uh, a lot of people have read the Bonhoeffer book. Dan Rather read the Bonhoeffer book. A lot of people like that would read the book, and I honestly think that they would not think, what, what is this? It's some Christian book, because I am 
made by the Lord, I believe, to, 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 to communicate in a way, hopefully, that can reach people beyond our uh, terrarium. And um, I've never said that before. What should I say? Uh, the world. And, and I feel that that is important for us to try to speak in to the culture. My Luther book was reviewed by the New York Times. First time I got a big review in the New York Times. And it was, you know, they had to say some negative things, you know, because once you find out who I am, you can't, you can't give a gushing review. But they said a lot of nice things, too. They understood this is a biography, and uh, they can, you know, gr grade it on its merits and stuff. And I think it's very important for us as we're able to be in those places. And it's one of the reasons uh, that I'm uh, friends with Sam and, well, former friends, but in any event, once, once upon a time, we were friends. And, uh, and with Larry, because God has created us and positioned us in some ways to speak into the culture. So Larry's writing for The Atlantic or this or that, or I wrote for The Wall Street Journal. That's important. It's important for us to do that. Uh, earlier today, um, I think it was Tom was quoting the Dutch statesman and theologian Abraham Kuyper, who about 120, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, made that famous quote. I only know this quote because my hero and ultimately my friend Chuck Colson would quote it nearly in every speech. And I'm not kidding. It, 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 for sure in every other speech. But, but Abraham Kuyper, I mean, it, the fact that he was a theologian and a statesman tells you that he already believed this. He said, there is not one square inch in all of creation over which Jesus Christ, who is sovereign, does not say, mine. So how is it possible that Christians get so focused on theology or we get so focused on the political or some one issue that we forget that it all belongs to the Lord. And we're supposed to live that way. I mean, the overcoming victorious Christian life means that you step into the world knowing you are, we are his children. He is our father. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's a completely different view than, oh, we're just these poor Christians and, and I just, just want to share the gospel with one person before I die, you know, that kind of thing. Any, any really sad, pathetic, broken down people in the room that can, can relate to that? Don't admit it. Don't admit it. But you know what I'm talking about. We kind of act like, oh, I don't want to impose my... Impose what? Your reality? Like it's reality. The gospel and the truth of the gospel, it's re, you're talking about reality. And not only reality, that applies to everybody, but truth, which applies to everybody. And then... If you think about it, because again, it's not this little parochial, little relig religious thing that you believe. It's truth. And so it applies to everything. Every part of culture and the world ought to be touched by our faith because our faith is not this little parochial philosophy. It's faith ba it's, it's fact-based. It's truth-based. And if it weren't, Paul tells us, if, if Jesus did not rise from the dead bodily, you know, he's basically saying, like, look, I know that's crazy. I know that never happens. It doesn't happen. When you're dead, you're dead. So if it happened, and we know it did happen, we know it's a miracle, we know God is alive, and we have the courage never to shrink from anything because we know this is true. And if we didn't know this is true, we should shut up about everything. But we know this is true, and we live totally differently. And so God is everywhere, and he wants his children to be everywhere and in everything as God calls us. Some of us are called to business. Some of us are called to uh, the world of journalism. Whatever it is, we're supposed to live our faith in that world. So I guess I just want to say that um, the book that I wrote, which is called Fish Out of Water, uh, this is kind of funny. Um, I've always wanted to write the story of my life because it's, I want to write the story of how I came to faith because it involves a miraculous moment, a miraculous dream where the Lord spoke to me uh, in a dream. It changed my life overnight, absolutely stunningly. It's, I always say it's like I went to bed single and woke up married, like it happened. I don't know what happened, but I'm a totally different person. I changed. I accepted Jesus. It was a wild miracle, but I had this crazy idea that I want to tell this miraculous story to non-believers. That's something that I personally call evangelism. Have you heard of that? Yeah, you have to speak to non-believers, otherwise it just doesn't work by definition. That's the problem. So 
I said, I want to write my story in a way that would maybe appeal to people who would not pick up one of those Jesus books. So it's kind of tricky, right? How do you write a book that, but I really believe the Lord made me to do that. And I thought, you know, it happened around my 25th birthday. And so I said, I'm going to write the story of my life from when I was born till my 25th birthday. And in fact, the dream weaves together, this is the God we serve, weaves together so brilliantly that nobody would dream anybody made it up. The Lord weaves together three pieces of my life so spectacularly that in the dream it completely blew my mind. I knew it's uncle over Jesus is Lord. I get it. It's true, right? But in order for those three elements in the dream at the end of the book to make any sense, you have to tell the story before that so people are tracking so that when they read about the dream they get it the way I got it at the time so I said I want to write my book but I want to write it I want to write a literary memoir I don't want to write a book that as soon as you look at it you go oh it's a Jesus book it's a faith thing I'm not into that because my contention is that everybody is interested in Jesus they just might not know it isn't that the key it's kind of like, you know, I, I, today I was flipping around on the TV and they literally have like a bass tournament being covered by ESPN or something like that. I just think that's really stupid. I was in a bass tournament as a teenager. I won in my category, but I released the fish before they weighed it so efficiently I didn't win. But <laughs> the fact of the matter is that I, I really think it's kind of like the bass fishing channel. If you're not a bass fisherman... You just would flip right past there, not because you hate those people. You're just like, well, that, that's just not for me, right? Well, that's how most people feel about your faith. You may be a nice person, but it's just not for them. They're spiritual in a different way, or they just don't, you know, that's you. They don't understand, of course, it's for them. If they're made in the image of God, he designed them for himself. There's no way around that. But they've been given this idea that in order to be a Christian, you have to be religious. So you have to be kind of like your neighbor. Or you have to be whatever. They don't understand that it's not that way. And so I wanted to write a book that it's kind of fits into the culture. So that if somebody gets it, they don't go, oh, yeah, it's the Christian book. No, thanks. Uh, I want to deceive people. <laughs> and I want them to think, like, it's just a fun story. Now, the fact of the matter is the book is loaded with insane, funny stories, which are all utterly true because I lived them and there's not I hate when people say well it sounded better in the story I want it to be true so I'm telling these stories and every syllable in the in the stories is true these are funny stories and you say well why'd you put them in there well I put them in there in a sense because if somebody says to you hey tell me the story of your life you'd include those stories these crazy stories that tell you everything about who you were at that time and who your family is and that kind of stuff. So these crazy, funny stories, they're not all like that, but there are, I mean, there are some whoppers in there, and I put them in there, and if you are only interested in quote-unquote sharing the gospel, uh, you may have this idea that, you know, you don't want to de depart too far from the four spiritual laws. That's really of the flesh. Well, I, I beg to differ. Uh, I think that uh, we've got a very truncated view of what it means to share the gospel. We have a very truncated view of the gospel. And we focus on evangelism sometimes to the exclusion of Jesus and all of reality, which is not a good thing. We forget that there's this rich world full of truth and that sometimes simply by speaking truth, you're pointing to Jesus. You don't need to, to be pointing literally to Jesus to be pointing to Jesus. Anything you, anytime you point to truth... Uh, you're, you're pointing to Jesus. And I think we have to have the, 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 the wisdom and the confidence to, to say, Lord, give me discernment so that I'm not always freaking out about whether I'm exactly sharing the gospel this minute with that guy because he could go to hell tomorrow and I'm so scared. That anxiety is not of God. When the scripture says be anxious for nothing, it means for nothing, not for evangelism, not for anything. But in all things, you know, bring your requests. So you can pray to the Lord, but we need to pray out of a confidence and a joy that he hears our prayers and that he wants those people to get saved more than we do. And I really think that sometimes we have bought into these bad religious ideas. And let's, let's just cut to the chase. A bad religious idea that is not from Jesus or pointing people to Jesus is satanic. Think about that, right? It's not like, well, it's not as good. No, no, no. It's satanic. Like when you buy into 
a bad idea, you could say, yeah, but, but, but I mean, if it's about bringing people to the knowledge of Jesus and you've bought into some bad religious idea that ultimately is driving people away or keeping them from him, that's pretty bad. So this is not to make us feel guilty, but it's like we need to take this seriously. We can say, well, that's how we've always done it. You know, well, God longs to communicate to everyone and to the people who will never darken the door of a church until God reaches them outside the church. That happened to me. I wasn't reached in a church building. I was reached in a dream. I was unconscious. <laughs> I, and, and spiritually speaking, you know, you want to talk about how much grace is involved. Since I was unconscious, I cannot take a lot of credit. Uh, it's kind of like, like Lazarus saying, yeah, I got up out of that tomb because I, I exercised my faith. No, actually, you didn't. You were a rotting piece of meat, Lazarus. You exercised nothing. It was 1,000% God and 0% Lazarus, right? So he's like, well, you got to exercise your faith. Well, we could talk about that another time. But when it comes to salvation, we know, it's a, first of all, it's a mystery. If, you, if you're not comfortable with the idea that it's a mystery, you're some kind of Calvinist, and I have no patience for that nonsense. <laughs> uh, the fact of the matter is it's a mystery. But we do know it's the Lord, okay? And so, anyway, I wanted to tell the story of my salvation. But it required me to tell all these other stories that have nothing to do with God. Because guess what? Before I was a Christian, yeah, exactly. I wasn't a Christian. Right? Does that make sense? So I had to tell all those stories. And if you're a bad storyteller, you telegraph you know, the punchline, you telegraph the punch. Uh, you, a good storyteller or a good boxer or a good joke teller, you don't do that. You want to tell the story so that when you hit them at the end, bam, they didn't see it coming, right? Yes. Glory to God. So, so in, the, in the book, I really, it's effectively a secular story. I mean, there's, they're glancing things. If you read it, you'll see God in my life when I didn't quite see him in my life, and it's there. But it's not there in such a way that it would scare away a secular reader, because I was hoping people will, will, Christians will buy the book and give it to their non-believing friends, and the friends will actually read it. They won't just say thank you very much and, and put it someplace. So the irony is that I went to a secular publisher, Viking, you know, big New York publisher who published my Luther book, published uh, we're, we're, they, they, we signed a contract for this book, and when, and when he got the manuscript, the editor, he basically said, it's, yeah, it's not Christian enough. <laughs> he, he sees me, you know, like I'm the faith guy, that's my brand, that's going to move books, so he's not interested in a literary memoir that secular New Yorkers might read. Um, and he basically said, you know, you need to write a, a book that's more... Like, it's got to be all about faith and conversion and stuff. And I thought, okay. Uh, and then I realized, I can't do that. What are you talking about? This is the story. This is the whole point of the book. So I literally had to go to a Christian publisher to publish the non-Christian book. Okay? So that, that's, that's a good sign for the church, I think, that you have Christian publishers who get this stuff. Because you can imagine them not getting it, and many of them wouldn't get it. But the, the story... Uh, in a nutshell, which kind of explains, I think, you know, my biography kind of explains my, where I'm coming from. My parents, my dad came from Greece. I mentioned some of this yesterday. My dad came from Greece. My mother came from Germany. Uh, and they met in an English class in New York City. Um, if you are raised by a Greek and German, that means you will be raised Greek. <laughs> I don't know if, if that makes sense. Like, Greeks know they're the best nationality. They're not going to apologize, okay? That's, it's just the way it is. And, you know, you got to deal with that. And imagine being my mother. Just think. So, uh, so I was raised in the Greek church, uh, the Greek Orthodox church. But like a lot of you, church can be, you understand this because some of you have experienced this, church can be a cultural experience, right? It's not a bunch of wicked people teaching you satanic doctrines, but neither are they giving you the gospel and giving you a relationship with Jesus or anything like that. So the experience of growing up in the Greek church, which I write about obviously in the book, uh, is very much like that. It was a warm community of Greeks. It was a, a wonderful thing. But they were not really about to, they didn't understand that, oh, we live in a secular culture. You know, wherever they were coming from, it was like the Muslim Turks and us, and that's it. So we're Christians just because we're not the Muslim Turks who are trying to kill us, right? You, you know the history. So they didn't, 
prepare young American kids for the secular world into which they were uh, putting us. And so I went to Yale University, which is, of course, the dream of a working class you know, European immigrant. My parents didn't go to college, and so this is a dream. But of course, nobody had any clue that they're sending me as a sheep among wolves. That I grew up in, in, a, in, a, in a home where they really did teach me to love America and to fear God or to, or to respect the church, even if I didn't hardly knew what that meant. So to, to go into this world uh, at Yale, I was, I was simply not prepared for it. Now, look, there are, there's a lot of funny stuff in the book. I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't want to give you the impression that, it, that it, it gets horribly serious. Most of it is just stupid, stupid funny stories. I want to assure you of that, right? I actually, I, I gotta, I'll tell you uh, three of the shortest. My father, this is unbelievable. If, if, how many people here, anybody here grow up uh, in America with parents who were not Americans? Anybody besides me? Man, I am in the South, at least one. Okay. So, but in New York, it's like most of us, right? Actually, it's not, it's not but it's enough. And it's kind of funny, the disconnect, right? Your parents went through the war, and now they're in America, and they're not thinking about, you know, the things that most American parents are thinking about, like, you know, we got to get a dog and what kind of bike you're going to get. They're just like, there's food on the table, shut up. So, I mean, my parents were spectacular, they, 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 and, and I just spoke with them today, and I love them deeply, but it's just so funny because it's a totally different experience, and I think in a way, that's why the book's called Fish Out of Water, because I always felt like a fish out of water, and uh, I, you know, as a, as a kid whose mother was German, we spoke English at home. All the other Greek kids in the Greek community spoke Greek at home, so I felt like a fish out of water in the Greek community. If I was hanging out with Germans, I felt like a fish out of water because my father is Greek. If I was hanging out with the Americans, I felt like a fish out of water because I wasn't that American. My parents were weird Europeans, and I got liverwurst sandwiches, you know, and it, it was just not, it was not normal. But my father, who I, I, when I was telling him about the book, he was, he was worried. Like, I tell him, you know, I'm writing about this, but he's like, you're not writing about that. I was like, Dad, like, you're, you're going to be 94. Like, I think it's going to be okay. I don't think you're going to get canceled, Dad. Like, you're really worried that I'm writing about this thing that happened in 1974? So, but he was really worried about it. But there are funny stories. And I said to him, Dad, look, I didn't plan this, but y you end up being the hero of this book without my planning that. You just are the hero of the book because my father was a self-sacrificing, sweet human being who gave everything for his family. And unless you're a... a, a you know, a Philistine, you, you eventually appreciate that. You might not appreciate it at the time. But my brother and I, of course, you know, kids are easily embarrassed. I remember, well, this is not an embarrassing thing. We were five years, I was five, my brother was four, and he took us to College Point Park. It's like on the East River, which, by the way, did you know the East River in New York is not a river? It's a footnote in my book. It's very important to me. It's an estuary. But I just love facts like that. It's called the East River, but it's actually not a river. It's an estuary. In any event, we're there. I'm five. My brother's four. And we're just, like, kicking a soccer ball around. And my father, you know, my father didn't understand baseball or football. You get this, right? So we're kicking a soccer ball around or something like that. And we're, we're just exhausted. And suddenly, we hear the plinky metallic strains of the ice cream truck has come to the park. And we lose our minds, and we're trying to pull my father up. I think he weighed about 170 pounds at the time. We're trying to pull him up with our little arms off the blanket. You know, we want ice cream. And my father says, this is just so you understand the perspective. This is what my father said. He says, no, no, no. It's not necessary. Uh, I have V8 in the back of the car. <laughs> that, that was not delivered as a joke line. Like, he's like, what's the problem? You, that's That's... No, you don't want ice cream. I already got. I already thought of this. I got V8 in the back of the car. So, like, what? What five-year-old doesn't want warm, gaggy vegetable juice on a hot summer day out of the pizza oven of the 1960 Valiant? Let, let's go. Let's go. Let's get the. Anyway, I mean that's true, right? When I was like maybe 12, we were at a McDonald's, um, and <laughs> we're at a McDonald's. Now, some of you will get this. Some of you won't get this, and I'll have to explain. We were at a McDonald's. My brother's like 11, I'm 12, maybe younger. My father goes up. My father never, we never ate out because like, you know, during the war, they didn't have McDonald's. You understand that? In Greece, there's no McDonald's. So we, we go, my father, my mother always would be the one taking us to McDonald's. But this time my father took us and he looks at the board and he has a 16 year old behind the counter. My father says, eh, eh give me one whooper. 
And my brother and I, we died 10,000 deaths because it's like, Dad, first of all, it's not pronounced whooper, it's pronounced whopper. He said whooper. But far worse, this is McDonald's. Burger King is across the street. It's across Route 6. That's Burger King. They have whoppers or whoopers, whatever you want. They don't have that. So we just died. But I thought, whose father doesn't know it's pronounced whopper? That's the family I grew up in. But maybe the best one is when I was about 18. And, you know, when you're starting to get really that tension of, of you know, you're that age and you just can't bear anything. And I remember, <clears throat> I know because my daughter w w just went through that age. And I, I was at the kitchen table and we're filling out financial aid forms for Yale or something like that. Like just, the, just pure hell as far as I'm concerned. I'm a humanities guy. I'm not a mathematician. I'm sorry to disappoint Sam Sorbo. But the point is that we're, we're filling out financial aid forms and it's just, it's just death. And my father would make everything worse. Like somehow he would just make it more painful. And we're sitting there. And at some point, you know, taking a line from some stupid sitcom I watched, I said to my father, I don't want to talk about it. Like, I, nobody really talks that way. As certainly I didn't. But, I, like, I'd heard it on TV. I don't want to talk about it. So I said this to my father, you know, slightly disrespectful. I don't want to talk about it. But my father, bizarrely, did something similar. And he never, ever did anything like this. He, he meant to use something that he had heard in the culture, a cultural phrase. And what he meant to say in response to my, ah, I don't want to talk about it, was, hey, what do you think I am, a leper? Now, my father would never say anything like that. He'd heard it in the carpool going to work. He barely knows what that means, right? But that's not what he said. In this moment of horrible tension, when I say, ah, I don't want to talk about it, my father says, who do you think I am, a leprechaun? <laughs> All right, so now, yeah, my father, to this day, to this day, my father doesn't know what a leprechaun is, right? We didn't hang around with the Irish, all right? We don't like those people. So, but the fact is that that was my upbringing, okay? So I was not raised in an evangelical home or anything like that. And, and I think it's helped me ultimately to, to see things from the outside as, as a believer. How do we reach people that they're just not part of this? They haven't heard this all their lives. They don't speak that language, right? And so obviously, uh, you know, I, I mentioned I, I went to Yale. And I had no clue going to a place like that that I'm going to be suddenly hit with a completely different worldview. The globalist, you know, Obama, secularist, world, that whole worldview, I, I was really trained to think like that. Now, I didn't really particularly buy the whole thing, but neither did I know my, what I believed enough to push back against it. I just was going with the flow. And, you know, I always say that, it, uh, Sam was talking about education this morning, it's obvious that education is ult it's ultimately meant to answer the big questions. What's the meaning of life? Why am I here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? Is there a God? Uh, is there meaning in the universe? I mean, those are the, the real questions every human being has, and everything else is just details. So computer code, languages, history, whatever, all helps you answer those questions. But places like Yale University ceased answering those questions a long time ago. I mean, you get Darwin in 1859, so we evolved out of primordial soup. Randomly, our life has no meaning, literally no meaning. That is so bleak that the people who claim to be atheists can't face it. It's too bleak. So the only atheists who've ever faced it, like Jean-Paul Sartre, Camus, Anthony Flew, a handful of serious atheists, not flippant pseudo-atheists like the, you know, eternally uh, furious Christopher Hitchens or, you know, they're just always angry and vicious and stuff. But they, they clearly, they hate God and they want to have fun attacking God and his people and how stupid the Bible is. But they, they don't dare face the bleakness of what they claim to believe. So ultimately, they're horrible hypocrites because... If you really believe that the world has zero meaning, there's no God, therefore there is no good, there is no evil, I mean, we can't even comprehend that. It hurts our heads. What does that, even, what does that mean, right? There is no good and no evil. We evolved out of the primordial soup. It's meaningless. It happened by accident. You mean nothing. The love you have for your spouse or your kids or your grandkids or your parents, it is just chemicals. It's chem it has no transcendence, no meaning. There is no such thing. Now, if you really believe that, 
if you believe that like murdering and torturing people is not evil, it's meaningless, okay? Who actually believes stuff like that? Effectively, nobody. I mean, the Marquis de Sade believed that. He believed that, and he, he believed in kidnapping women and torturing them and raping them and killing them because he didn't believe anything. And so who's able to be brave enough to live that out other than the Marquis de Sade and Hitler? And who, who believes there is no meaning except what I create? Who can face that? I would say almost nobody. And the, the atheist that I mentioned who did face it, Anthony Flew, Camus, uh, Sartre. I mean, I write about them in my upcoming book, Is Atheism Dead? But I mean, they were troubled by this. I mean, Camus and Sartre, they're trying to come up with a moral system apart from God. They were serious about this. They said, we know there's such thing as, as good and evil. We just need to figure out how to get there without God. And they couldn't. And they were brave enough to admit that they couldn't. Think about that. They understood this is not good. And so both of them, this is little known, and which is one of the reasons I put it in the book, is because people need to know, they both basically came to faith at the very end of their lives, infuriating their friends and disciples. But, I mean, Woody Allen's another example. He believes there's no meaning in the universe, okay, but he's not happy about it. Any interview where he talks about this, you can see he's disturbed. This is not fun. It's sort of horrifying, but we go on. So people like Christopher Hitchens or... or, or uh, Richard Dawkins, whatever, I really think that these are deeply foolish people. I mean that. They're brilliant, but profoundly foolish, because they have not begun to connect the horror of what it is to live in a world with no God, with nothing transcendent. It's so bleak, most of us, we can't even begin to stare into that abyss. It's satanic. It's horrific. But they kind of say it very flippantly. But the problem at places like Yale and in the academy out there is that that's sort of what they all believe, but they don't have the guts to really address it. It's too horrible. And they don't want to, like, you know, lose students and money. So they don't go there. So what do they do? They effectively communicate, and this is kind of where the culture is, right? They sort of communicate, well, we know it's not all true, but we don't want to look too closely. We just figure... Here's what you do, like get a really good job, you know, study hard, get a really good job and, you know, go for the brass ring and don't think about this and it'll all be over in a few decades. But just don't think about these questions because they're too horrible. So don't think about it on the weekends. There's like alcohol and sports. Don't think about this stuff. Don't think about the meaning of life. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. You don't want to think about it. It's too horrifying. Don't think about it. Get a great job. That's what it's become. Get a good job. Well, if you have any level of introspection, you know, you're going to say, well, that's really dumb. I'd like to know what, you know, I'd like to fi figure this out. But, you know, they, they kind of also larded over with the idea that, hey, if there's no God, you can have guilt-free fun. Just do whatever you want. Just go for it because there's nothing. So it's really bleak, but they can't address the bleakness of it. And so that's the message that they effectively put out. Now, I, coming from a working class you know, European immigrant home, uh, I was not interested in going to college to get a good job. I was interested in actually learning, and I, I'm, the Lord just made me that way, and so I was an English major, and I was just kind of looking into the meaning of life with these great books, which kind of give you a lot of clues to the meaning of life and the meaning of humanity, and I took it fairly seriously. I was not, you know, uh, somebody looking into this in, a, in, a, in an ordered way. But that was really my gut, you know, that I, that I cared about this. So, but the problem is, everybody at Yale, they're, they're like, you know, they're setting you up. Don't think about this. Like, we've, we've looked into it. It's horrifying, okay? 1859 Darwin, then you get Freud. Then you, you, you do not, you don't really want to know about this. So just work hard, stay busy, party, get a good job. Whatever. Okay, punchline, Eric is an English major. He wants to be a writer. He graduates, obviously, he does not get a good job. Obviously, I floundered and floated because, you know, if you're an English major, now, what did it cost my parents who had no money to get this degree, right? You know, it just cost us like a billion dollars to get the degree, but try to find a job with a Yale English degree, good luck. So, yeah, I didn't know until it was too late that my parents were supposed to be wealthy. If I had a trust fund, that's a great major, right? So, I graduated, and I always say that, uh, you know, so I floundered and floated trying to be a writer, and I always say that if you flounder and float out of college in the way that I did, there's just only one thing that can happen. You will move back in with your parents. 
And if your parents are working class European immigrants who didn't have food on the table, much less go to college, much less get to go to Yale, they're not gonna have a whole lot of patience for that. So um, my friend's parents were kind of like, oh, Eric, Eric's finding himself, you know, he wants to be a writer. And my parents were like, yeah, Eric should find himself a job and get out. <laughs> so it was a very, very horrible year for me, honestly. Um, and in the middle of that horrible, horrible year, uh, I mean, I had to get some job. So what did I get? What job can you get with an English major in Danbury, Connecticut? Well, for me, it was simple. I got a job as a proofreader at Union Carbide Chemical International Conglomerate. It was, some of you know the Hebrew, it was Gehenna. It was like the worst experience imaginable. I was the editor of the, of the Yale Humor magazine. I was like a poet. I wanted to write fiction and stuff. This was pure hell. I'm reading chemical manuals eight hours a day. And it, it was unbelievably bleak. I mean, the, 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 the little cubicle, because I'm not exactly a corporate guy, right? You figure that out. So this was so horrible. And my cubicle was literally in this vast international headquarters, a quarter of a mile from the nearest window. <laughs> May, I might be exaggerating, but not much. It was just horrible. And in the midst of this horror, I mean, the, and then, of course, at the end of the day, I would I'd go home and my parents would glower at me. It's like, yeah, we, we lived through the war and uh, we got here, and uh, we're really not interested in your problems, Eric. What do you say? What do you say? Uh, it's, I mean, my parents loved me through everything, but it was just a horrible time. And honestly, sometimes God has to do that to get our attention. Isn't that the case? I really believe it's why he's brought America to this pass, so the church will wake up and fight. Because he wants us to, and I believe we will, but we had better because it's everything is on the line. Like I said yesterday, it's a war. Well, the war for our souls is extremely similar. And so I'm brought to this place of hell. And in the midst of this, uh, a graphic designer floats into my life who worked there and starts sharing his faith with me very gingerly. He didn't share it in a way to spook me. Um, and we began these conversations, and, and I was in enough agony to want to continue talking, but I'd been trained at Yale with my parents' money to avoid, like the plague, anything that smacked of conservatism or Christianity, because we all know those people are obviously crazy, violent insurrectionists, right? Ra raise your hand, guilty, come on. And so, so it was this kind of cat and mouse game, and it went on, and at the end of maybe 10 months, of me sort of pretending to be a Christian and having conversations, but he knew I was not. Uh, the Lord spoke to me in this dream. And I'm not going to tell that because it's, it's too long, but the point is that if you, no, tough. It's actually, if you want, if you want, the story is told in my miracles book and it's told much more fulsomely in my book, F Fish Out of Water. And if you go to my website, ericmetaxas.com, there, there's a video where I tell the I Am Second, some of you know that ministry, I did a video for them, it's a super short version of it, but it's just a total miracle. And obviously it changed everything for me. And I thought, okay, Lord, like I've not been managing my career too well, so what do you say, you, you take the wheel for a couple of decades, what do you say, Lord? And so the Lord led me on this strange journey. And in that journey, it's fascinating to me to think that because I came into the faith from the outside, I'm never one of these people who bitches about the church. It's only people who are raised in evangelical homes that are like, oh, the church, and they start telling you about these youth pastors they had and stuff, whatever. I didn't have that. We didn't have anything. Like, you, if you're raised in the world and you go to the Greek Orthodox Church, you don't have a youth pastor, you don't have anybody you can complain about. They basically, like, ignore the whole subject, basically. And so, so I, I was so grateful to find truth, to find the truth, the one who is truth. It just changed everything for me. And I really thought, Lord, what do you want to do with me? Like, certainly anything's better than this, but, you know, when I was proofreading. But I really knew that the Lord had created me for his purposes, so I gave myself over to him, and he took me on this bizarre journey. I mean, I worked for VeggieTales. I worked for, by the way, how many people know that Phil Vischer, who's been a friend for all these years, right, you know, at the, at the heart of American evangelicalism, but he is into you know, uh, systematic, uh, what, what do you call it? Systematic, systemic racism and stuff like that. So it's, it's all through that, through that world. But before any of that stuff existed, I worked for VeggieTales and I worked for Chuck Colson. 
And I ended up writing these biographies, which I never wanted to write a biography. The Lord took me on this strange journey. And I can tell you straight up, the Lord led me, sometimes very clearly and other times less clearly. But in retrospect, it becomes clear that the Lord is leading. If you give yourself to him, he will lead you. And it's, you know, if anybody asks me for career advice, that's the career advice, folks. The Lord wants to lead you more than you want him to lead you. So you, th you think about that. So it's not like, well, what if I screw it up? What if I screw it up? No, no, no. If, if you give him your heart and say, Lord, lead me and are obedient to him, he leads you, right? So when you're saying, well, what can I do about where we are in the country now? Just say, Lord, lead me. He's a miraculous God. Uh, he knows how to lead us if our hearts are willing. So he led me on these um, strange journeys. And I, uh, one thing um, that I want to say, uh, because it's related to everything, is that when you live in a world that is peddling the insane idea that there is no God or that you can have freedom without faith and virtue, all we really need to do is make that case reasonably well. Even with the tiny platforms we have, it couldn't be more of a slam dunk, case closed situation. When I wrote the book, Is Atheism Dead?, Honestly, I was astonished at how black and white it is now with regard to, is there a God? Th there is no question that any rational person has to say, yes, there's a God. Now, if you want to talk about who is the God or the nature of God or what does it mean in my life or I still hate all those Christians, you can have that conversation. But the idea that there's no God is intellectually more bankrupt than the flat earth theory or anything along those lines. Now, you wouldn't know this from the culture, and I hope my book changes that conversation, because it is the things coming out of science. Again, you know, as I said, I grew up in a, in a reasonably secular culture, but not utterly secular. We went to church, and, you know, I grew up in the heartland. Danbury, Connecticut is, is kind of the working class heartland. It's not like Greenwich or those with rich suburbs that are, you know, sending kids to the Ivy League. And, and in the normal American world, you know, people, they might not know exactly what they believe, but they believe that there's a God probably, and they believe, they believe in those things. And I, so I grew up with all of that. And I guess when you really think about the idea that we've drifted so long now that there are people who are brazen. It's not just that nah, religion's not for them. They're brazenly declaring there's no God. And I'm here to tell you, in the 50 years that people have been effectively declaring these things, the, the, the evidence, the welter of evidence has shifted so dramatically and even the church hasn't picked up on it, which is why I wrote this book, because I just said, this is nuts. Even we in the church don't know this. So the science is pointing to faith in a way that 30 years ago, you couldn't say that. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years, you couldn't say that. But it is now, it's like sick. But nobody really knows it. I mean, some of you are familiar with the fine-tuned universe. How many of you are familiar with that argument, the fine-tuned universe? So a handful of you, even that one, which has been out there for 30 years, most even Christians don't know that. And when Christopher Hitchens was asked, what is the most compelling argument on the other side? He instantly said, in a rare moment of truth, I'm sorry to say he was not my friend, but I got to tell you, he was a monster when it came to polemics and debating. He was just rip your head off, lie, exaggerate, humiliate. He didn't, you know, if you don't believe in truth, why not, right? Well, in a rare moment of truth, when he was asked that question, he said, oh, the fine-tuned universe, there's no question. But he made it really clear, that's the one thing. But there's a lot more. I'm not going to go into it now. It's in the book. But i got to tell you, it is game over. The, 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 the clarity of the idea that there is a creator, a designer of the universe, if you need to have profound faith not to believe in that. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. So... I think about this because I go back to, the, to where we are in the culture. The culture doesn't know what I just said. And even the church, the reason the church is often so timid, they don't really, many people don't really, really, really believe this stuff. They're like, well, that's how I was raised. I hope it's true. We're not supposed to hope it's true. We're supposed to know it's true. You don't die for something hoping it's true. You don't base your life on something hoping it's true. You need to know. And I'm here to tell you we can know that it's true, or we can certainly know that believing in what the scripture says is infinitely more reasonable than not believing it.
let's just go there. Infinitely more reasonable, but, but that's not out there, and again, it's not even in the church. And if the church understood this, we would behave differently. We would behave differently. When somebody puts a gun to your head, you need to figure out, do you believe this or not? If you believe it, you'll be brave. If you don't, you won't. And the fact of the matter is, in the, in the third world, the, people are living this out. They realize, I can't, I can't hedge my bets. I'm going to either be killed or I'm going to live this way. Or we can hedge our bets in America. We are so comfortable and, and it, we, we don't have to deal with it. But I'm here to tell you that the darkness is increasing, but I believe the Lord has ordained it that the light is increasing and that the church is going to become more confident and more bold as we learn these kinds of things. But I think about, this is no joke, when I was at Yale, I, I almost cannot believe this and I can't believe everybody doesn't know this either because it's so crazy. Um, I, I wrote about this uh, a few times, but no kidding. Uh, when I was at Yale, I began to pick up this idea that everything's kind of a joke. We don't take the meaning of life too seriously. We also don't take the meaningless of life too seriously. Remember, as I said, it's too bleak to face it. So we kind of have this like flippant attitude toward everything, this kind of ironic thing. Everything's kind of half joke. And I remember I didn't have that attitude because I thought, I come from a family, we didn't get to go to college. Like, this is a big deal for me. You know, these ivied walls, it means something to me. It's not like just a, a lark, you know, while, uh, before I get my stupid job at uh, Goldman Sachs or whatever it is. And by the way, if, if you're a banker and I've offended you, I apologize. I won't, it won't happen again. Um, but no, I'm just saying that I took it sort of seriously. And I remember one day I was in Sterling Library. Now, Sterling L Library, this in itself is a story of the 20th century. In the 1920s, in the elite culture, remember I told you about Bonhoeffer in Union Seminary, in elite culture in the 20s, they'd already figured this stuff out. Remember, 1859 is Darwin, Freud is, you know, turn of the century and, and the next 20 years. They've all figured out what's what. So they're not being really bold about it, but they know. So they decide, in 19, around 1925-26, not to build the new um, magnificent chapel that they were going to build at Yale University. They decide no longer to make chapel mandatory in 1925. Think about it. It was founded by godly ministers in, you know, 1701. And they had drifted already by that time. And so imagine that around 19, 1725, sorry, 1925, they make this decision, we're not going to have mandatory chapel anymore, that's over, and we're not going to spend all that money to build this monumental new chapel. What are we going to do? We're going to build a new library. We're going to take that money and more money, and we're going to build a new library. And they give the money to, you know, the hip architect of the day, John Gamble Rogers. You know, he tries to do something kind of hip and funky, just like people are doing today with the, you know, the ugly art that Sam was, was referencing and stuff. It was, you know, let, let, let's not forget, this was all well on its way by 19, the late 20s in the, in the intelligentsia, okay? Yeah, Picasso, you know, he didn't happen in the 70s and the 80s. You get that, right? All this stuff was happening early, early, early in the century. So Yale decides we're going to give the, the, this uh, money, and it was like a fortune, at the time. I can't remember the, the sum, but it's, it's in two of my books. I've written about it, and it's, it's, a, it's just a fortune. And what did he do? What did he do? And this gets to my punchline. He says, I'm going to build a library that is going to, in effect, be a monument to secular learning. And you could find this cheeky or blasphemous, but he says, I'm going to make it look sort of like, not sort of like, intensely like a European cathedral. So Sterling Memorial Library, if you don't know what it is, you know it's a cathedral when you look at it. Like it just looks, it's got a front, the doors, everything, everything about it is designed to look like a cathedral. And then when you walk into Sterling, there is a long aisle down the middle which looks for all the world like the aisle down the middle of a cathedral and the, uh, the Gothic architecture and everything. And at the end of this cathedral-like space, huge, is what looks for all the world like an altar. And I'm not kidding. Now it's the circulation desk. 
but it was designed to look like an altar in a cathedral. And what is above the circulation desk? Again, this is the late 20s that this was all done. Above the circulation desk is a big mural that, if you don't look closely, looks like the Virgin Mary, a huge mural of Mary. But when you look more closely, no, no, it's not Mary. It is an embodiment of Alma Mater, our mother, the mother of the university. But everybody, if you look at it, it looks, it looks like an altar mural. And what's it called? It's called the altar mural. The architect was in on the joke. This was not, you know, something that just happened. Uh, and the, 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 the center is called the nave. I mean, it's all like a big joke. Now, some people might think, oh, it's a, it's a joke. And other people might think, you know, that's pretty freaking offensive to me because it's not a cathedral. It's a library. But this is going with the theme that we are now going to deify or lift up secular learning, and we're going to put it in the place of whatever. I mean, we were going to build a chapel. We're not going to do that. This is the new kind of chapel. So that's the message that is being sent. And I say this because it just gives you background of where we are in the culture that this was happening in the 20s. None of this happened yesterday, folks. This is the long march through the institutions, the institutions of architecture, the institutions of the academy and everything. So basically, when you get to the circulation desk, this is, this is what I wanted to, to come to because I've never, you couldn't make this up, but this is true. You get there and then you make a right if you want. If you make a left, you go to the big reading room. If you make a right, you go down what looks like a cloistered walk from Cambridge or Oxford, a beautiful cloistered walk. Okay, this was all built, you know, uh, around 1929, uh, but it's built to look like a medieval cloistered walk. And there are these things that uh, you, you can imagine. There are these windows with no glass looking out onto courtyard, or maybe they have glass. I can't remember anymore. But the point is that there are these big windows, the granite, and the whole thing. You've all seen it. And um, and at the top of each of the center, between the windows, are these things called corbels, which are uh, kind of bas-relief sculptures, and there are four of them, and what do they depict? They depict student life. So again, the big joke in 1928, whenever he was commissioned, student life. So the first one is of a student in bas-relief carving, and he is uh, asleep at his desk. He should be studying, but ha-ha, there's a mug of beer there, and he's sleeping, and there's a radio, which was the, you know, Whatever, that's all they had back then. So there's a big radio next to him. So ha, 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 he's not studying. The next one uh, has a student. He's also not studying. I don't remember the details, but there is a curvaceous pinup that he's looking at. Now imagine, this is literally carved in stone. So this is pretty clever stuff. But they said, yeah, we're going to make fun of student life. Now to me, you know, if your parents work menial jobs to send you to the university, like, I don't know that they or even I would really appreciate like, ha, 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 yeah, it's a big joke because our family's been going to Yale since, you know, 1740. No, we don't take it lightly. Like, this is an honor and a sacred thing. They're making fun of it, you know? The third one uh, is making fun of it in a different way. And again, it's in my books. I cannot remember how. But in each one, the students are not studying. They're, they're doing something else or whatever. But it has this mocking feel. But the fourth one takes the cake and buttons everything up. The fourth one, the student is studying. And there's a book in front of him. And what does the book say? The granite book carved, the bas-relief book. You know, it's about this big, right? On the left-hand page are the letters U, period, and then a big R, period, and then a big A, period, kind of diagonally going down like this. And on the right-hand page, just four letters, J, O and then K and E. So you look at it and you go, oh, you are a joke. Now, that works on a simple comedic level, right? Ha, ha, ha. It's kind of like, you know, somebody gets a microphone and goes, hey, you're all jerks. Like, that's the, that's the level of humor, right? You're jerks. Uh, you are a joke. So he reads, you're, a jo you're an idiot. Now, why is he an idiot? Why is he a joke? Because he's studying and everybody else is, like, doing what you would do if life were meaningless and you didn't give a darn about actually like learning or anything like that. Uh, it's kind of mocking him. But then I thought, no, this is an intense distillation of the worldview of Yale University in 1930 and today that they don't dare broadcast particularly loudly, but here it is in stone. And it is that you, 
Like, you want to study? Okay. Uh, these other guys aren't studying, so you want to study. You really want to know, like, what the deal is? Well, okay. I, I, would, I would advise you to distract yourself with uh, the pinup or the radio or the beer or something. But if you, if you insist on studying, you're going to be the nerd to study. I, I, I'll tell you. Here's the punchline. Here's what it's all about. You are a joke. Your life is literally meaningless. You evolved out of primordial soup from nothing into nothing. You're going to die. You have no soul. There is no beauty or goodness or transcendence. These are fictions created by us to help us get through this meaningless life. You are a joke. And at that point, it becomes so dark and nihilistic that it feels a little satanic. Because that's the message that Satan wants to give us. You're nothing. You're nothing. And I hate you, and I hate the fake God that you worship, and you're nothing. And you'll always be nothing. It's a voice of damning rather than blessing. You're a joke. So I have to say, that's distilled. It's literally carved. They're not going to get rid of it. And it kind of sums up the world that we're in, except that most people cannot face this. And so we live in this lie that life has meaning, there's good and evil, racism's wrong, like we know all this stuff, but we have no reason to know it. Because if there is no God, tell me please, why is racism wrong, tell me? They wouldn't even dare go there. Because according to their philosophy, actually it's not wrong. We just say it's wrong, and if you don't say it's wrong, we'll cancel you, but we know there's no good or evil or meaning. So we're just floating along in the lunacy, making arbitrary rules. But ask somebody who doesn't believe in God or the Bible, why is racism wrong? Why is anything wrong? Why is torturing children wrong? Please tell me, because their lives are as meaningless as a bug's. And, my, and people say, oh, well, it's self-evident. So you know, they, they'll throw terms around like self-evident. Like, OK, so you're saying you don't know. You're just saying we should all know, right? The fact is, we get all this stuff out of the scripture. And if you cancel the scripture and you cancel the God of scripture, you can have no morality. Now look, this is math, people. This is not like my strange philosophy. This is simple math. But who's willing to face this in our culture? They can't. They just want to distract you. Have a good time. Don't think about it. So imagine if you sell that message to people. Well, again, Nobody's selling that message. You don't see the BLM crowd saying, we're Marxists, we don't believe in God, we don't believe in truth, we believe in power, we're going to get the power and the money, and we're going to crush you. They're not, they're, they're not going to say that. They're going to pretend that they believe that they're honorable and that racism's wrong and they're crusaders against it, but they don't have the beginning of an idea of why it would be wrong, other than if I'm black, I don't want to be discriminated against and I want to get more power. Well, that's not really a moral argument. You're just telling me, you want what you think I have, but you're not telling me about anything transcendent. That's where we are. So what do they do? They just pretend you can have good and evil and all this stuff and morality and whatever without God. But we have to know that is utterly impossible. It's not difficult. It's impossible. The greatest minds in atheism not only saw to the bottom of that abyss, but came out believing in God because it's too painful. So again, we live as though, you know, we're, we're, we're going to just like, we're going to fake it. Think for a moment about this. The freedom we have in America, and I just want to close with this. The freedom we have in America, the idea of freedom, it's the antithesis of the Marxist idea, okay? Marxist idea says we can't have God. The, the Christian idea, or I should say the American idea of self-government, ultimately you need God. You cannot force God because once you force God, you don't have freedom. Freedom is free, right? I mean, we pay a big price, we pay in blood, but the point is that there's a conundrum at the heart of it. But the founders knew, every one of them, every one of the founders knew that without a virtuous and moral populace, this can't work. They knew that. You don't need to be a born-again believer to, to, to know that. Jefferson knew it. Franklin knew it. They all knew it. That the only way it works, and Tocqueville saw it 50 years later, the only way it works is if people govern themselves of their own volition. Why would you do that? You do that because you have virtue. Why do you have virtue? Why do you do the right thing when the government doesn't force you? There's one reason. You answer to a higher authority. 
I don't steal because God says it's wrong and I want to honor God. You don't need to point a gun at me. You don't need to threaten me. I just don't steal because I fear God. So I don't need much government. I can govern myself. The founders understood this. Os Guinness puts it this way. He says, he calls it the golden triangle of freedom. He says, freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith. But faith in turn requires freedom. So what we have, CL was saying earlier that, you know, you, you can't have freedom and all this stuff without God. Now, that's basically true, but let me add to it or clarify it. You can have it for a while. You're, you're living on fumes. We are living on fumes right now. Right now, when people thunder against racism and they thunder against greed and they all this kind of stuff, we all know that's all Christian stuff. And they've got the Christian stuff without God. But you can't hang on to it very long. Eventually, if God is pushed out and out and out, this other stuff is going to slip through your fingers. There is no way for us to have the kind of freedom and blessing we've had in America unless a certain segment of the population takes God seriously and creates a culture that takes virtue and those kinds of things seriously. But you can't force it. The founders understood that, well, hey, if we figured it out, you need that, so let's just make everybody go to church and do quiet times, and, and Bob's your uncle. We'll be free forever. You can't do that. You can't force it. They knew that in the old country, when government was wedded to faith, it, it wouldn't work. People wouldn't do it. They wouldn't believe in it. You need to own it yourself. It needs to be yours. So what happened? They figured out, we're going to create this thing. Faith and freedom go together. They're inextricably intertwined. You cannot have a good, flourishing, free culture without God, but you can't force God. So that's why Franklin, leaving the Constitutional Convention in 1787, says, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. She says, what have you given us, Dr. Franklin? You know, have you figured this out? Is it possible for people to live free? Never happened in the history of the world. How did you pull it off in that room? Did you do it? Maybe you didn't. Why should you be able to do what no one's ever been able to do? Well, the reason they were able to do it because George Whitfield had been preaching up and down the 13 colonies, revival had broken out, and adding to their knowledge of what they knew from the classics and, and the, from the Romans and the Greeks was this essentially virtuous populace that was virtuous enough and, 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 and there had been enough revival they thought, we think we could do this. But it's up to you, the people. We, the people, determine whether it's done or not. Nothing can force it. But once you take God out and once you take virtue out, which you can't force, but if you let those things get away, if you cease to keep them, it all melts down. So it's important we know these things. I only discovered these things fairly recently. I didn't grow up knowing these things, and when I first became a believer in uh, 1988, I, I, I didn't learn these things very quickly. It took decades for me, in a sense, to process some of this, these things, and through friends like Oz Guinness and others, to make sense of it. Um, I, I didn't want to, I, I, I meant to start with this, but we've run out of, I think, all of my books. And what I was going to say was that most of my books, if you don't want to go to Amazon or one of those places, you can order them from Mike Lindell's MyPillow.com. On the right-hand side, he has a MyStore.com. And at MyStore.com, almost all of my books are now available. The only thing is you have to use the code ERIC or you don't get a good discount. So I just want to say that. Obviously, uh, I, I believe strongly in these things, but I think, as um, Tom said earlier, uh, if we don't do it, and I don't mean me and Sam and Tom, and I, I mean, if we don't do these things, if we don't teach ourselves these things and learn these things ourselves and be evangelists for these ideas, it goes away, folks. That is the price of freedom and all of these things. We all have to be more involved. If you want people to do stuff for you, you can move to China. But if you want to be free, you have to do these things. But doing all these things, learning these things, teaching them to our children, there is no greater privilege. We don't deserve to live here, but we do. Rejoice in it and rejoice in the Lord who gave you this gift. God bless you.